Mr. who will be talking to us about uh, drought responses and transcriptome side plasticity. Tomia, yeah. thank you. Um, cool. So I'm really excited to be here. I actually missed the last botany, um, and it kind of left a hole in my heart. And I'm really excited to, uh, to be back here again and keep the tradition going. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the study system I've been working on and presenting here for a number of years. Um, not everyone's familiar with it, so I'll kind of briefly give you a little uh, uh, catch up on what I've done in the past with this system and what this system even is. Um, why we're using drought as a physiological stressor, um, and then I'll dive right into the transcriptomic response to drought. So I work within the genus Tomia. Um, this is a member of the Saxifragaceae, and this is really one of the clearest examples of autopolyploidy that we know of in nature. Um, it's a really nice, simple system for these kinds of studies. There's only two species within the genus. There is a diploid that occurs south of central organ that gave rise in the past to an autotetraploid, one genome duplicated, um, that occurs north of central organ. So nice and simple. Um, further simplifying this is if we look at a phylogeny that includes um, representatives from uh, multiple tetraploid and multiple diploid populations, what you can see is the tetraploid and diploid populations are reciprocally monophyletic, and there's very little sequence divergence between the different tetraploid populations. This is kind of consistent with an idea of the tetraploids arising from one ancestral diploid population. We're not dealing with kind of the common polyploid scenario of multiple formations, multiple origin kind of things that would further complicate uh, a lot of comparisons. One of the first questions I asked uh, in the past uh, was, okay, so these plants are occurring allopatrically. Are they doing so just by chance, or do they actually have separate niche requirements? And so some work I presented a few years ago was looking at whether there was niche divergence, and there was some abiotic niche divergence between the diploid and the polyploid. Uh, we drilled down into that a little further and looked at where the tetraploid populations in red versus the diploid populations in blue occurred within environmental space. What you can see is that the tetraploid populations in red are shifted along uh, that y-axis away from the diploid centroid. Uh, this y-axis is predominantly explained by precipitation-related variables. I had an undergrad that followed this data up um, and wanted to experimentally test whether dry down um, actually physiologically affected these plants. And so um, through a series of experiments, she kind of very nicely showed that there's evidence of adaptive crossover between the diploid and autotetraploidomia with respect to water use efficiency. So at times of high soil moisture, the tetraploid photosynthesizes uh, more efficiently with respect to water loss, but when you dry it down and get down to drought conditions, the diploid photosynthesizes more efficiently than the tetraploid. So kind of Makes sense that the tetraploid occurs, uh, the diploid occurs down into California where it's a lot more dry. So um, that was kind of our idea that was the basis for this experiment I'm going to be talking about today, where we're actually looking at the molecular um, kind of underpinnings of this drought response. And so we tried to integrate everything where we started with the ecology, validated it with some physiology, and then we wanted to kind of look at gene expression change, um, what's the response to drought, what's the plasticity of the response. Um, and one big problem with this is we're doing diploid and polyploid comparisons. Um, a lot of RNA-seq studies actually rest on the assumption that your transcriptome size is not variable. Um, I think we now know that that is not always the case. Um, in the past, I presented some different methods using spiking RNA standards to account for this and normalize RNA-seq data three different ways. Uh, Concentration-based comparisons, um, per biomass comparisons, and per cell comparisons. Uh, because I presented this and it's available to preprint, um, I'm not going to uh, spend time on that. I'm going to dive into the actual application this time around. Um, feel free to grab me, though, if you're interested in those. So for this study, we had uh, four tetraploids and four diploid individuals, um, representative of two populations each. We grew these hydroponically um, so that they could have equivalent water availability. We didn't have to worry about soil issues. Um, and in to, to induce drought stress, we treated the hydroponic solution with a 20% PEG-6000 solution, which is the equivalent of negative 0.6 megapascals of water stress. Um, we sampled these plants uh, over time, both at time zero prior to water stress, then 24 and 48 hours um, post-drought stress. Um, we then did our synthetic RNA spike in um, and sequenced these using four runs of Illumina Nexseq. Uh, we ended up with around 45 million reads after cleaning um, per replicate. So diving right into the results, uh, this is a principal component analysis of expression level per cell, so a proxy for absolute abundance differences, um, using the 500 most variable loci. And so to walk you through this, uh, the diploid individuals are outlined in red, the tetraploid individuals are outlined in green. Uh, each individual through time is connected by dotted lines, with the time zero prior to drought has the blue center, 24 hours post-drought, yellow center, and then orange is 48 hours post-drought. 
Um, there's a couple things we can glean from this. Um, the tetraploid and diploid individuals are pretty well separated from one another. Um, the diploid individuals are actually clustering by population. So the triangles go together, the diamonds go together. Um, and the other thing we see is that the magnitude of drought response um, seems to be fairly consistent amongst the diploids. Uh, from the first 24 to the second 24 hours, uh, that magnitude of change in those 500 most variable loci is pretty similar. We don't see any of that in the tetrapoids. We see um, no clustering by population, which makes sense given the phylogenetic data that we have uh, that I showed a little earlier. Um, nor do we see any consistency in the magnitude of drought response. We see some individuals responding very little overall, some individuals responding um, a little bit over the second day, but mostly over the first day and vice versa. So there's just a lot of variability going on that we don't see in the diploids. Um, and then we just kind of wanted to take just a snapshot of what's happening with the actual transcriptome itself. So this is um, a proxy for transcriptome size. This is essentially um, all the transcripts normalized per cell. Again, a proxy for absolute abundance um, uh, sum. So this is just really, again, a very rough approximation of transcriptome size based on these data. Um, and what you can see here is that the diploids in red, um, over time, each individual is represented by three bar plots, times 0, 24, and 48 hours. What we see is there's a little bit of variability there, um, roughly about 30% kind of uh, fluctuation, which is in line with the number of genes that are typically recruited um, during drought stress response. So that kind of makes sense to us. When we look at the tetraploids, it looks crazy. Um, we see huge variations, several orders of magnitude full change in uh, the number of um, uh, some breeds representative of transcriptome size that we don't see um, in the diploids. Um, some of this might, you might argue, some of this could be an artifact of uh, different normalization processes, but the actual sheer magnitude of it means there's probably something going on there that we are picking up on, um, and there's no rhyme or reason to it based on what we're looking at here. So this is something we'd love to explore further um, in the future. But we also wanted to kind of dive into what are specific genes doing, specific gene functions doing, and um, this is a little different way of characterizing differential gene expression because we have time series data. Um, we're actually able to uh, ca uh, characterize things uh, slightly differently. So here's an example of uh, a locus that we're calling differentially drought responsive. So you can see um, all the uh, uh, diploid expression in red for all four individuals as a uh, profile of the expression over time, and then the tetraploid in green. And what you can see is the response directionality is quite similar, but the magnitude of the response is higher in the first 24 hours in the tetraploid. And so we would call this as uh, differentially drought responsive. We characterized all 25,000 genes uh, in the transcriptome um, to see if they were differentially drought responsive or not, and about 10%, uh, 2,500, uh, were differentially drought responsive. That's a lot of genes to sift through, so we clustered them into 18 bins using hierarchical clustering. Um, and then each one of these uh, gene profile bins was um, uh, tested for functional enrichment for gene function and, and ontology. And so I'm going to talk very briefly about some of those. Um, one thing we didn't find, it was really, really surprising, we didn't find any enrichments related to abscisic acid production. Those of you that are uh, plant biologists, which most of you probably are, um, uh, might know that abscisic acid is kind of the quintessential drought response hormone. Um, we found nothing related to abscisic, ac uh, abscisic acid dependent pathway responses as differentially drought responsive. I think there are a number of reasons why you might not have found this. Come find me if that's something you're super interested about. I'd love to chat about it. Interest of time, I'm going to move on to what we actually did find. So we did see some evidence of some acidic acid independent response differences. We saw some enrichment of salt um, uh, response uh, pathway genes. Um, and salt and drought stress are actually pretty closely linked, so that's not a big surprise there. The tetraploid responding um, with upregulation relative to the diploid, particularly over the first 24 hours. Same goes for ubiquitin activity. Ubiquitin has been shown over and over again to uh, uh, really uh, be a big player in abscisic acid independent drought response pathways as well. Something that I'm going to talk about next um, has to do with reactive oxygen species. Um, there's been a lot of work lately looking at how reactive oxygen species can build up in the apoplast, the intercellular space in plants, and, and can actually wash downstream over uh, cells throughout the plant, prompting a whole suite of abiotic stress responses. Uh, this has been kind of termed a reactive oxygen species signaling wave, and it's kind of a mechanism of systemic uh, stress responses. And so we're dealing with transcriptional data, talking about 
um, reactive oxygen species abundance right now. So again, this is going to be very hand wavy, but this is also kind of starting to work through things, thinking about hypothesis generation for things we can later empirically test to see if this is leading us in the right direction. And so I was really excited to find that there were some enrichments related um, to increased production of transcripts related to amine oxidase activity in the tetraploid relative to the diploid. Now amine oxidase is one of the primary uh, producers of hydrogen peroxide in the apoplast, which is the primary reactive oxygen species signaling molecule. Um, something else, so you've got tetraploid cells producing perhaps more hydrogen peroxide dumping it into the apoplast. We've got prior data suggesting that the tetraploid cells are also less dense. So you're building up more hydrogen peroxide to be spread across fewer cells, um, which is really going to be leading to tetraploid cells perhaps being subjected to a much stronger reactive oxygen species signaling wave relative to the diploids. Add on to that, that these tetraploid cells, again, previous data we've presented here, suggest that they're photosynthesizing per cell at a much higher rate than the diploid equivalent cells. Photosynthesis is one of kind of the other primary contributors of reactive oxygen species in non-stress non scenarios. And so tetraploids are also perhaps um, harboring a higher homeostasis, uh, 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 redox homeostasis relative to the diploids, just even in the absence of drought. Um, and this is actually something that's been shown quite nicely in Arabidopsis diploid and auto tetraploid comparisons. So not a, not a surprise there. And so we kind of see evidence that they might be coping with this in the rest of our functional enrichments. We see enrichments related to oxidase and reductase activity that's really only changing in abundance in the tetraploid, but not in the diploid. Um, we see the same thing for tetrapyrrole production. Tetrapyrrole is, a, is one of the critical precursors for chlorophyll. If you're trying to rebalance your redox homeostasis, one way to do that is to start um, shutting down photosynthesis slightly. And so reducing tetrapyrrole production is one way for the tetraploids to start limiting photosynthesis and photooxidation during drought stress. We see the same thing with uh, transcripts associated with ATP synthase coupling factors, which are another mechanism for avoiding photooxidative stress. And so to paint a little picture for you, we've got tetraploid cells that are a little larger, a little less dense than diploid cells that prior to drought are just more photosynthetically active, so a little, perhaps a higher redox homeostasis. You throw drought at them, one of the responses is producing amine oxidase, more than you see in the diploid, dumping a bunch of hydrogen peroxide into that intercellular space with the apoplast. Um, so apoplastic hydrogen peroxide is going up and driving that redox balance out of balance. Um, and what we see is that perhaps as a way of bringing it back in balance, we see the tetraploids, um, one, producing oxidases, reductases, um, but also bringing down their tetrapyrrole ATP synthase coupling factors, really bringing down photosynthesis, perhaps as a way of getting that redox balance back up. And so to put this in context of what I kind of opened with, we, uh, we had previously presented, and I mentioned earlier, that there seems to be an adaptive crossover between the diploid and tetraploid in water use efficiency in response to drought. Tetraploid cells, the tetraploids as a, as a whole, photosynthesize much more efficiently during times of high soil moisture. Um, each cell is photosynthesizing more effectively, but there's a cost perhaps to that. They're more susceptible to redox uh, disbalance. And so as drought stress starts to hit, those tetraploids start shutting down photosynthesis and start photosynthesizing less efficiently, um, which would be evidence in their water use, uh, water use efficiency. Um, well, the diploids, which are lower photosynthesizers, um, do not seem to be shutting things down nearly as much as the, the tetraploids. So they're able to maintain that water use efficiency while they're photosynthesizing, which is why during drought um, they're out um, photosynthesizing their tetraploid um, compatriots. So again, that's hand wavy. I would not, um, you know, put money on that. I think this is a cool idea that I would like to start exploring very uh, empirically, looking at um, reactive oxygen species abundances. Um, so that's kind of some future directions we're thinking about. I don't want that to take away from, although it was only two slides. Um, really, one of the kind of the one of the more exciting things about these findings was that despite a single origin or a genetic bottleneck um, of the tetraploid being formed. Um, it's still ex exhibiting really tremendous expression level variability, um, wildly more than the uh, diploid. Um, and that could be one explanation why when we look at where the tetraploids in red occur within environmental space, 
I mean, this is the case in many polyploid systems, but not all of them. Um, they tend to inhabit a larger environmental breadth, despite having lower genetic diversity. Um, so this just might be one mechanism for having um, more variability. We're um, trying to follow up with this. One of the things that I'm really interested in following up with um, is if there is all this plasticity in transcriptome size, it better be translated. And so we're really interested in looking at um, ribosome abundance um, and whether that's scaling with transcriptional size. Because if your translational throughput's not scaling with transcriptome size input, um, it's really just biological noise and isn't actually having a phenotypic effect. Um, to that end, if that's something that you're really interested in, um, I just finished my first year at uh, Sacramento State, um, getting my lab all set up. I'm always looking for master students that are interested in polyploidy. Um, shoot me uh, an email or, or tweet at hoity-ploity, um, and I really uh, appreciate you guys listening.